Joining the Army is a very, very big life decision. It's not like going to McDonald's. Out, you have to work at nine to five. The Army likes an all-volunteer force for several reasons. One, it lets the Army be more selective, and we can focus more on quality. What do you think about being drafted if you don't want to go? How about the women? Women have the same political rights, then they should be expected to have the same duties. We let women vote on this, but they can't be drafted. My reason for joining the Army was just to basically serve my country. Honestly, it was. The government should be able, in a sense, to require or demand certain things of citizens. In ancient Greece, for example, you could not be a full citizen unless you were ready to shoulder arms. You're already being made to do things for your government. Opt in. Buy in. You're part of the country. Deal with it. I think the most important thing is the individual's right to choose what they want to do with their life, since, after all, that is why we have democracy in the first place. I'm caught right in the middle because I believe everybody should want to serve their country at least a couple of years. Well, historically, there's a very strong linkage between the obligation to military service on the one hand and possessing the full rights of citizenship on the other. Uh, in ancient Greece, for example, you could not be a full citizen unless you were ready to shoulder arms. And indeed, in many of the Greek city-states, you were expected to bring your own arms to the field, your own shield and sword and horse or whatever it might be. Well down into modern history, this, the, this linkage between citizenship and service has been very, very strong. In the 19th century, the era after Napoleon, uh, most of the European countries had massive conscript armies. The United States did not. It was a distinguishing characteristic of this society, and indeed it's why many immigrants came here, was to avoid military service in Europe. The one exception to that in the 19th century is the Civil War, when uh, both the Confederacy and the Union had to resort to obligatory forced military conscription in order to fill out the ranks of their armed forces. The draft was administered by military officers who actually came in uniform into districts and uh, forced people into service, and there was plenty of resistance to that. And the most notorious example is uh, in New York City, there were major draft riots when largely Irish immigrants uh, who had come to this country not anticipating military service uh, refused to serve. Dozens of people were killed. Contrary to a lot of mythology, there was plenty of resistance to the draft in the First World War. There were some 300,000 identified draft evaders. The people who ran the draft in the First World War learned, or thought they learned, from some of the mistakes in the Civil War. Instead of having military officers go into districts and recruit people or enlist them, they set up civilian draft boards. Advertising was just becoming a big business. The techniques were being learned and developed. And the, the, the military service, or the draft, in World War I was just one of many areas where the government employed the techniques of this infant industry of advertising to achieve its goals. The public was heavily propagandized. And indeed, even the conscription system was called selective service, thus putting the word service at the heart of the matter and trying the best they could to preserve the fiction, as Woodrow Wilson said, that the nation had volunteered en masse for the war, which was just patently not true, but they tried to uh, perpetuate that idea nonetheless. This country uh, mustered 16 million men and a few hundred thousand women into the armed forces in World War II, and again, uh, folklore to the contrary notwithstanding, the great majority of those people were drafted. It meant that the country really had to buy into this deal. Uh, millions of people had to somehow feel that their being pressed into service was legitimate. The country as a whole had to accept as legitimate the diversion of 40% of its production to wartime purposes uh, to, rather than civilian purposes. Members of your government are gathered here in this federal building in Washington to witness the drawing of numbers as provided for in the Selective Service Act of 1940. Once we break that link between massive citizen participation and the actual conduct of the war, then we raise all kinds of very troubling questions about how easy it is to go to war, whether the public's assent is really any longer even necessary for the deployment of military force. <laughs>
World War II, in many different senses, ended an era in the history of warfare. It was the last war that was fought, and I believe ever will be fought, between large, huge, massive conscript armies fighting on the basis of a deeply mobilized industrial economy at home in a protracted war of attrition. For a period of about uh, almost 30 years, from the late 40s into the early 70s, the draft was a, an enormous presence in the lives of millions upon millions of people in this society, including me. <laughs> when the Cold War got hot in Vietnam, and had an actual shooting war, and a lot of people who just as soon not be shot at uh, found themselves conscripted into the service. The draft became a focal point for resistance to the war, protest against the war. A lot of people didn't think we should have a draft. Uh, the people who were being drafted were absolutely sure we shouldn't have a draft. I shall not seek, and I will not accept, the nomination of my party for another term as your president. Thank you. Thank you. In 1968, Richard Nixon became the Republican presidential candidate. And advising the Nixon campaign, there were some quite unlikely champions of those kids out in the streets burning their draft cards. One of them was Milton Friedman, a very controversial figure, but someone who eventually won the Nobel Prize in economics. I talked to quite a number of SDS groups, and I always got along very well with them because it was clear that our objectives were the same. And what we were talking about was not objectives, but how you achieve those objectives. On those grounds, he had long called for the end of the draft and for the creation of something that many people considered impossible, namely an all-volunteer army. The use of compulsion is repugnant to our society except in cases of dire emergency. It is long past time that we return to our basic heritage, got rid of the compulsion in our military service, and return to a voluntary system. Nixon wins the election of 1968, but it was a squeaker. He only won by a little tiny fraction. And um, I think we can say that if he had not said that he'd get rid of the draft, he would not have been president of the United States. And once he was elected president, uh, Nixon almost immediately created a commission to consider uh, the idea of creating an all-volunteer force. One major question the commission had to wrestle with was whether a volunteer force would, in effect, become the equivalent of a mercenary army. Historically, people have feared mercenary armies, not least of all because they hold the prospect of severing the link between military service and citizenship with all its rights and privileges. Two of the people on Nixon's commission were Milton Friedman and Alan Greenspan. A general who was, came before us in testimony uh, made the case as to why the draft would be a mercenary army and unacceptable to the American culture and indeed for military efficiency. And so I spoke up and said, General Westmoreland, would you rather command a slave force? And he said, I don't like to hear my, uh, my drafted uh, soldiers referred to as slaves. And I said, I don't like to hear my uh, patriotic volunteers referred to as mercenary. Milton sat there and took his arguments apart piece by piece never raised his voice. In any event, General Westmoreland, you are a mercenary general, and I am a mercenary professor. We are served by a mercenary lawyer. We are served by a mercenary doctor. The general got redder and redder, and at the end of this little set of dissections, the mercenary argument was thoroughly demolished. I don't, and that was the end of the discussion. Shortly thereafter, Nixon's commission voted unanimously to end the draft, and in 1973 it became official. Now the Army was competing for employees with every other business in the country, which forced improvements in military salaries and benefits. When the all-volunteer force came into being in the 1970s, uh, the military actually hired advertising agencies, public relations agencies, to advise them on how to fill the ranks and to persuade people that military service was something they wanted to do. Hey, sir, Major. Sir, how are you doing? Good. Hey, this is the action we talked about. We're oh, in a market sir. economy, and we understand that, and we, we have what I think is a great product. Advertising for the armed forces is much more complicated than it is for a consumer product. Going into an armed forces, 
It's a life decision. We began crafting ads to reach influencers and specifically parents. So, Dad, that's something I need to tell you. How much is this going to cost me? Even more specifically, mothers. My mom, please. The mom who basically stands in the door and says, whoa, wait a minute. Knowing right from wrong and believing in myself, wanting to go to college, that came from you. So what we want to do is make sure that the, um, the parents understand what the benefits of service are, how it is a life-changing ex experience for their child. What we're showing in the advertising is really what it's all about. We're not trying to varnish uh, over any kind of issues. It, it's tough. You can't tell them a lie. Because all they have to do is watch TV at night and they know what the Army's about. The difference today is we've got 502,000, 502,000 volunteers in the Army. These are, these are people that have asked to be in the service. They're here during a time of war because they want to be here. I think the principal worry about the all-volunteer force is precisely its capacity to be used without the civil society in whose name it fights, having any very focused or felt interest in the actual use of the force. Would you like to have a draft? A draft makes it harder to go to war because, because the debate is more reasoned, people are more invested. As long as we have an all-volunteer force, no one is required to pay attention. And no one is required to put their lives or their sons and daughters' lives on the line. We get into our cars, we isolate ourselves, the war happens over there. I don't know a single person in my life who's fighting in Iraq, not one. Go to the high school and get the ones that are 16 or 17 years old. Say, hey, what do you think about going to Baghdad if you don't want to? Say there are 50 people in the class, they know there are three or four that might like to go in the military. And if they did, they'd be really good at it. Okay, is that better than taken by the scruff of the neck Somebody that does not want to go into it and would not be any good at it, it's much easier to run a bad war with a draft than without it. You just call the person in charge of the draftee and say, I want 50,000 more. And he will get your 50,000 more, and if they don't turn up, they go to jail. That kind of authority vested in the government, that kind of capacity to command the lives of citizens is only legitimate in the face of a truly dire threat to the very existence of the country on the scale of World War II, let's say. I'm not sure World War I really qualifies, as a matter of fact. The Civil War certainly qualified. Uh, but absent a threat on that scale, it seems to me that we ought to be very wary about uh, granting the government the right to uh, control our lives down to that level and to that degree. My father served 24 years in the U.S. Air Force and my grandfather served 28 years in the U.S. Army. So I figured it was my turn to do my part. I can't understand why no one would want to go out and you know, serve their country, protect themselves, protect their families, and to do what other forefathers have done for us to get us to where we are now. I would only be, want to be drafted if uh, I would believe the war would be just. You're already being made to do things for your government. Opt in, buy in, you're part of the country. Deal with it. I don't want anybody on my team, only those who are physically qualified, mentally qualified, and academically qualified. We have the right to choose. That's what makes America so great. We have the freedom to choose. 